The judge ruled that Santangelo had not been picked by Lacasio, but assigned to defend Lacasio on Gotti's orders. Lacasio stood and faced the judge to complain, pointing to the flag. Lacasio said, "That's the American flag, not a swastika." Hi everyone. Welcome back to my channel. In this video, we're going to take a closer look at mobster Frank Locasio who was a reputed Gambino consigliere and underboss. Frank Locasio was born in 1932 in the United States to Italian immigrant parents who came from the town of Bossina in Sicily. When he was 23 years old, Locasio became a member of the Cosa Nostra, a notorious criminal organization that operated in the United States. Frank has two children, Salvatore Locasio and Lisa Locasio. His son is also a member of the Gambino crime family. Under the tutelage of Albert Anastasia, Frank worked as a bookmaker and loan shark for the Gambino family during the 1950s. When Carlo Gambino became the boss of the family, Carlo kept his eye on the quiet soldiers like Frank Lacasio. In recognition of his loyalty and ability, Carlo Gambino promoted him to capo regime, which put him in charge of a crew in the Bronx, New York. When Paul inherited the family, Paul Castellano made sure that all his captains were kicking up their cut to the administration. Frank was one of those captains that made sure Big Paul got his taste every month. After 10 years being the boss of the Gambino family, Paul Castellano luck has run out. Paul was fighting the commission case and he was about to have a civil war break out within his family. On December 1985, Paul Castellano was killed on his way to a meeting with his captains. John Gotti took over as the new boss of the Gambino family. Lo Cassio was part of Gotti's inner circle and became a powerful captain in the family. bringing in millions of dollars each year through his loan sharking business. When Gambino underboss Joseph Armone was sent to prison in 1987, Lo Cassio became the acting underboss. Frank controlled the entire Bronx, even his peers like members of the Colombo crime family respected Frank. Gotti was running the family in a similar way to the days of Albert Anastasia, which was known for being ruthless and violent. However, this attention also brought consequences. The Gotti years were vastly different from the previous years under Carlo Gambino and Paul Castellano, and it was like being on a roller coaster ride. The government began to increase their efforts to take down the mafia, and Gotti refused to back down. Despite his determination, the outcome was inevitable. On December 11, 1990, the Gambino crime family's underboss, Frank Lo Cassio, was arrested along with John Gotti and Salvatore Gravano on charges of racketeering. Despite being under indictment, Lo Cassio maintained his loyalty to Gotti and was later convicted on racketeering and conspiracy charges alongside him. In a statement at his sentencing, Lo Cassio claimed his innocence but admitted to being a good friend of Gotti and praised his character, which infuriated Gotti's enemies. While serving a life sentence without parole, Gotti was angry of Lo Cassio's actions. Gotti allegedly sought the help of the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang to carry out a contract killing on Frank. It is believed that two members of the white supremacist group were hired by one of Gotti's associates to carry out the hit. Despite the alleged attempt on his life, Lo Cassio remained incarcerated at the Federal Medical Center Devens in Massachusetts with no projected release date. The incident between Lo Cassio, Gotti, and Gravano in jail in 1991, as described in Salvatore Sammy the Bull Gravano's tell-all book, Underboss, sheds light on the complicated relationships within the Gambino family. Lo Cassio gave Gravano a stolen orange and then offered one to Gotti, who became furious and belittled Lo Cassio in front of other inmates. According to Gravano, Lo Cassio tearfully vowed to kill Gotti and made a pact with him to do so if they were somehow acquitted. This incident reveals the deep-seated animosity between Gotti and Lo Cassio and the volatile nature of their relationship. The involvement of the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang in the feud between Gotti and Lo Cassio highlights the use of outside groups in organized crime. Gotti's decision to turn to the white supremacist group to carry out a contract killing underscores the ruthlessness of the Gambino family and their willingness to use any means necessary to eliminate their enemies. The fact that Gotti was caught complaining about the Lo Cassio passage on video cameras suggests that his involvement in the plot was not well hidden, and it is a testament to the effectiveness of prison surveillance in preventing violent incidents from occurring within correctional facilities. Meanwhile, in 1998, Frank's son, Salvatore Lo Cassio and Michael Mikey Scars di Leonardo were arrested for attempting to extort money from Scores, a high-end strip club in Manhattan. Despite the weak case against Lo Cassio, prosecutors offered to drop the charges against him if he pleaded guilty to tax evasion for deriving income from illegal gambling. As a result, Lo Cassio was sentenced to 10 months, including home arrest and a 1.5 million dollar fine. At the time of his plea, 
Lo Casio disclosed to federal probation officials that he had previously worked in a deli and supermarket until he launched a computer programs business in 1983, which grossed an estimated $15 million a year. Salvatore designed multiple porn websites. One of the websites would allow a free preview of the sexual content. To perform an age verification check, the customer had to enter their credit card information. The websites clearly stated that the viewer was getting a free preview and their credit card would not be charged. But Lacasio and crew were fraudulently charging $25 to $75 on these accounts. In another racket Lacasio and Richard Martino were running a telephone business called Audio Text, providing customers with pay-to-listen 900 numbers for sports, weather, and explicit chat, as well as deceptive 800 numbers that appeared to be free. The sex calls were routed through carriers to a station in Kansas and then to the Dominican Republic, where companies linked to low Casio employed scores of women to speak provocatively in multiple languages. Interestingly, the X-rated call center was located in a tax-exempt free trade zone, indicating low Casio's shrewd business acumen. In September 1995, just five of low Casio's phone numbers received half a million calls per month, demonstrating the enormous success of his phone business. Despite his lawyer's attempts to dismiss the charges against him, the federal authorities have countered by offering evidence of organized crime connections, including FBI video surveillance of John Gotti's old Ravenite Club on Mulberry Street. Low Cassio's crew appeared in more than 90 tapes between 1987 and 1991, all while his computer and phone businesses were thriving. After years of investigations. In February 2004, the entire Low Cassio crew had been arrested. Federal prosecutors estimate that the Gambinos grossed approximately $500 million from the phone cramming operation. Salvatore Lo Casio was sentenced to two years in federal prison, he was released on August 1, 2008. After his release from prison he is still considered a captain of his father's old crew. In contrast, Sammy Gravano, a Lo Casio former friend turned enemy, chose to cooperate with FBI and testify against Lo Casio and other members of the mafia. Gravano is labeled snitch and loses credibility in the streets. Gravano attempted to regain some of his reputation by making a podcast, a YouTube channel and appearing in a documentary called Mafia State of America. Years after Lacasio's conviction, he made a filing to overturn his conviction for the murder of Louis de Bono, which included a statement from Gravano affirming that Lacasio had no involvement in the crime. However, the attempt to overturn his conviction was unsuccessful and Lacasio remained in prison. As 2020 Frank's health takes a bad turn and Lacasio tested positive for COVID-19 but was able to recover was placed in the comfort care program at FMC Devons on September 28, 2021. However, his old age and various medical complications ultimately proved too much for his body to handle, and he passed away on October 1, 2021, at the age of 89. Okay that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more character breakdowns and analysis of your favorite gangsters. See you in the next one.